Act the committee will come back to order, please. At this time, we are going to recognize the second panel of witnesses. Uh, Ms. Teresa Golo is here. She is a deputy director, assistant director of the Budget Analysis Division for the Congressional Budget Office. Mr. David Foley is the deputy commissioner of the Public Building Service for the U.S. General Services Administration. Mrs. Maria Foscarinas is the executive director of the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. And Mr. F. Joseph Moravec is the former commissioner of the Public Building Service for the U.S. General Service Administration. Uh, thank you all for being here. Now, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. So if you would please rise uh, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And let the record show that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. And thank you, and please be seated. Now, in order to allow time for discussion, please, if you could, limit your testimony to five minutes, and your entire written statement will be part of the record. Uh, now, we have already I'm sorry. No. Ms. Golo, if you would, please. Thank you, um, Congressman Kelly, um, Congressman Cummings, other members of the um, committee. Thank you for inviting me here to discuss CBO's analysis of the President's proposal to dispose of civilian real property. I will offer, also offer you some thoughts about other actions you might consider to increase the proceeds um, from property sales. Under the President's proposal, an independent board would expedite the process of identifying unneeded property and present recommendations for disposal. Unless the Congress disapproves, the administration would implement those recommendations and agencies would be allowed to retain and spend some of the proceeds from sales. CBO concludes that this proposal would induce some agencies to sell property that would not be sold under current law and bring in a modest amount of additional receipts. But the pro proposal would allow the spending of those receipts and also of some of the receipts that will be collected but not spent under current law. The net result, CBO estimates, would be an increase of about $60 million in direct spending over the next 10 years. The proposal also would result in additional discretionary spending of about $400 million over the next five years, assuming future appropriations were provi provi provided to implement the program. Finally, some savings and maintenance costs would probably accrue as the stock of properties declined, but they would be realized only if future appropriations were reduced. CBO's conclusions are based on the experience of the Base Realignment and Closure Program, an analysis of the stock of unneeded properties, and on the outcome of previous efforts. The BRAC program upon which the President's proposal is based was not structured to maximize the return from selling unneeded assets. In fact, less than $2 billion from three sales have been collected since the process began in the 1980s. BRAC's goal is to consolidate operations and reduce O&M expenditures. It has undoubtedly led to such savings, although they are very hard to identify precisely. In addition, previous attempts to sell civilian property have had mixed results. Several high-profile attempts, including Governor's Island in New York, the Presidio in San Francisco, and the old Chicago Maine Post Office took years to complete and did not result in anywhere close to the receipts initially expected. The proposed civilian board would have goals similar to BRAC's but it would not offer many agencies sufficient new financial incentives to part with valuable properties. Some agencies that manage large stocks of real property can already retain and spend the proceeds from the sale of excess properties. So the President's proposal would not offer an incentive for them to increase the number or pace of sales. Moreover, some have the authority under current law to enter into other types of arrangements, such as enhanced use leases, which often prove more lucrative for them. Similar property holding, smaller, I should say, property holding agencies would probably consider the opportunity to retain proceeds as an incentive to sell additional properties, and those sales would bring in more receipts. But because agencies would be able to spend some of the receipts that will accrue to the Treasury under current law, the net impact would be a cost. Part of the problem is that much of the property identified as unneeded does not appear to be particularly valuable. The administration recently released information about 12,000 unneeded Federal buildings and structures. 
CBO reviewed that information and concluded that gaining billions of dollars from their disposal is unlikely. Most of the property is either owned by the Defense Department and not covered by the proposal, is already in the process of being disposed of under current law, largely through demolition, or is likely to be conveyed for little or no return. If the proposal is to generate significant additional proceeds, more properties will have to be identified and they will have to be far more valuable in the private marketplace than the properties currently listed. In many cases, they would be facilities that the government is currently using and that, would be, and that they would only be made available for sale by relocating ongoing activities. CBO has identified three approaches to consider if the Congress's goal is to increase the proceeds from real property sales. One, creating clear incentives not just to dispose of property but to maximize proceeds. Two, where appropriate, exempt from some properties from existing laws that slow the disposal process down or require that properties be donated or given away. And three, specify in law exactly which valuable properties must be sold. Even with those steps, however, the government's ability to sell land, as well as that land's market values, often depend on local zoning. Disposing of properties and maximizing sales proceeds will be difficult as long as local stakeholders oppose such efforts. Making changes could have unintended consequences, however, and the Congress and the administration will have to weigh the relative benefits and costs of various impacts. Thank you. I am more than happy to talk more about CBO's um, research in this area and answer any questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Golo. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Foley. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Kelly and Ranking Member, Member Cummings and members of the committee. My name is David Foley, and I am the Deputy Commissioner of GSA's Public Building Service. I am honored to join you today to discuss our asset management strategies and our government-wide role in disposition, as well as the unique challenges of the Federal real property disposal process and how a civilian property realignment initiative can help address those challenges to meet our obligation to taxpayers to reduce costs and spend every dollar as effectively as possible. As the Federal Government's landlord, we have a robust uh, asset management program to accurately track the utilization of our inventory, strategically invest in our assets, and aggressively dispose of unneeded property. When we find underutilized space, we evaluate whether there is a Federal need in that location. If not, we immediately begin the disposal process. GSA leads the industry and government with low vacancy rates and high utilization. Less than 3 percent of our portfolio is considered under or not utilized. An underutilized asset must be distinguished from an unneeded asset. It may still be in the taxpayer's best interest to retain an underutilized asset. For example, in the National Capital Region, GSA has 1.9 million square feet of underutilized space, but 1.7 million square feet is currently categorized as underutilized because it has been vacated to undergo a major renovation. These buildings will provide highly utilized, modern, and cost-effective space when the renovations are complete. In 2002, under Commissioner Moravec, GSA began a portfolio restructuring. Since then, we have disposed of more than 200 GSA properties valued at $467 million, covering more than 9.5 million square feet. Since 2005, GSA has had the authority to retain sales proceeds. This authority has returned almost $227 million to the Federal Buildings Fund. Beyond the proceeds the government received, those dispositions and demolitions also, also eliminated an estimated $484 million in future repair needs and millions more were saved in operating cost. Similar incentives are contemplated for all agencies in the administration's proposal. In addition to managing our own inventory, GSA has authority to dispose of properties for other Federal agencies. The Property Act disposal process and guiding environmental and historic statutory requirements create some unique challenges for agencies. These congressionally mandated requirements are intended to strike a balance between social and economic policy objectives. Each individual landholding agency is responsible for determining if they have an ongoing mission for the asset. If not, they report the unneeded property, which may be one or more assets, uh, access to their needs. When GSA accepts a report of excess for a property, we take 30 days to survey other Federal agencies to determine if there is another Federal use for the property. If no other agency needs the property, it is considered surplus to the government's needs and offered to public organizations, primarily State, County, and City entities. 
These entities can acquire the property through a public benefit conveyance or a negotiated sale at fair market value. If there is no viable public interest uh, for a benefit or negotiated sale, then GSA conducts a public sale of the property. This process can be as short as 60 days or take up to six months. Every property is unique, and GSA develops disposal strategies for specific to each asset's characteristics within the existing statutes. One of the most common delays in the process results from competing stakeholder interests and community expectations. The administration's Civilian Property Realignment Initiative would streamline the process while minimizing external stakeholder influences that could delay or interfere with effective strategic asset management. Based on our experience, we believe that, a ref that reform to real property asset management must address three central challenges. One, incentivizing disposals by enabling agencies to realize the benefit of proceeds. Two, addressing the upfront costs associated with disposals and consolidations. And three, resolving competing stakeholder interests that can slow down or prevent good asset management decisions. The Administration's efforts anticipate working with Congress to create a successful initiative, and we welcome the efforts of OMB, this committee, and other members of Congress to successfully reform and improve real property management. Given GSA's expertise in asset management and our experience partnering with other Federal agencies to dispose of real property, we are well aware, we are well aware of the challenges in domestic Federal disposition process. We welcome the opportunity to be part of the ongoing dialogue and, help, and can help inform the process of establishing a successful civilian property initiative. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here today before you, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Um, Ms. Voskarinas. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Kelly and Ranking Member Cummings members of the committee. Thank you for holding this important hearing and for inviting my testimony. I am Maria Foscarinas, Executive Director of the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. In 1987, Title V of the McKinney-Vento Act put in place a common-sense, cost-effective provision to help homeless people. Under the law, nonprofit service providers have a right of first refusal to acquire at no cost excess Federal real property to provide housing and services to people who are homeless. Providers take on maintenance expenses, alleviating a cost otherwise borne by the Federal Government. My organization assists these providers to acquire and use property, receiving no financial gain for our work. More than 2.4 million Americans each year receive assistance through Title V, which has provided access to nearly 500 properties, like the New England Center for Homeless Veterans in Boston, which serves over 1,000 homeless vets per year. Surplus Federal properties now provide shelter, transitional and permanent housing, case management, food pantries, job training, mental health and substance abuse treatment, and child care. As homelessness continues to increase across the country, this is not the time for Congress to weaken or eliminate this vital program. The Law Center understands the concerns of this committee and OMB that surplus Federal real property is languishing, but Title V is not the cause of delays in Federal property disposal process. Indeed, the Title V process takes only a few months and it should not be harmed or eliminated in the name of procedural reform. The Law Center has consistently worked with Congress, HUD, and other Federal agencies to improve and streamline Title V. As detailed in our written testimony, we recommend improvements. These include excluding properties that are not useful to homeless service providers, publishing available properties online rather than in the Federal Register, requiring HUD, GSA, and HHS to provide meaningful outreach and support to streamline the process, and making additional HUD properties, such as the HUD homes now in foreclosure, available to address dramatic increases in homelessness and cut costs. I will briefly um, now address the proposals before the committee. The Civilian Real Property Alignment Act, H.R. 1734, like the OMB proposal, would waive Title V rights and create a, quote, BRAC-like board to decide whether surplus property should be disposed of or sent to HUD for homeless use screening. We oppose both proposals in their current form. We are concerned that the proposed board would not fully consider the needs of homeless persons. We recommend requiring that the board include at least two members with homeless advocacy or direct service experience. Uh, 
We are also concerned that the proposals would eliminate Title V's most critical feature, the requirement that Federal surplus properties be offered for homeless assistance. We recommend a that a property must be offered to homeless service providers if a single member of the Board requests it. Finally, we are concerned about the deadlines. They would not offer enough notice to allow public comment to be well informed, nor enough time for homeless service providers to apply. We recommend a fairer, more reasonable timeline. H.R. 665 would create a pilot program granting the OMB director sole discretion over disposal of excess Federal real property for a 10-year period, waiving much of the existing legal framework, including Title V. We oppose the bill in its current form. We are concerned by the level of discretion granted to the OMB director in this proposal. The statutory incentive for-profit sale of the director would be a direct cross-purposes with the needs of homeless service providers seeking Title V properties at no cost. There is no reason to believe a significant number of providers would have any meaningful access to any properties that become surplus during the 10-year period. H.R. 1205 would create a pilot program that exempts a narrow set of properties from Title V. Because it would cover only a very limited number of properties, such as national security properties, H.R. 1205 would not be harmful to homeless persons and we do not oppose it. But we recommend the bill be expanded to include our recommendations for Title V reform. Homelessness is now increasing at dramatic rates across the country. Family homelessness increased by 9 percent in 2010 alone. This is not the time for Congress or the administration to reverse its commitment to the lowest income Americans. Thank you for allowing me to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Foscarinas. Uh, Mr. Moravec, please. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee. My name is Joe Moravec. I have spent most of my career in the commercial real estate industry as a broker, manager, and owner of commercial property and commercial real estate services companies. From June 2001 through July 2005, I had the privilege of serving my country as the Commissioner of GSA's Public Building Service, a position Mr. Moravec, uh, I am sorry, is your, is your mic on? Did, or maybe just move closer. We are not hearing you. From June 2001 through Thank you. Ju July 2005, I had the privilege of serving my country as the Commissioner of GSA's Public Building Service, a position for which I was well prepared professionally. As Public Buildings Commissioner, my goal was to apply well-proven private sector asset management practices to improving our agency's performance as a real property manager. Prior to 2002, GSA did not have, by private sector standards, a consistent, comprehensive, or measurable approach to investing appropriated funds in the repair and alteration of its inventory of owned properties. In simple terms, capital improvement funds were spread yearly over the entire portfolio without adequate consideration of whether buildings were capable of meeting the long-term programmatic needs of the agencies they housed or, indeed, whether they were viable as financial assets. Buildings of marginal utility were improved to perfection and buildings housing critical functions were often neglected. The backlog of deferred maintenance and the absence of a disciplined resource allocation process continued to swell. Our team developed detailed profiles of every single property in GSA's portfolio. We determined whether there was a long-term Federal need for the property and assessed whether the rent our agency customers were paying us justified reinvesting in it, and if so, at what level of investment. What emerged was a triage ranking of GSA's entire inventory, which divided the portfolio into three tiers of assets. The top tier was comprised of buildings for which there was a clear long-term Federal need. Investment in these buildings would result in a sustainable rental income, providing GSA with capital for continued reinvestment in their upkeep. These buildings merited reinvestment. They could stand on their own. The middle tier were buildings which could be made into sustainable financial assets by judicious reinvestment as outlined in individually approved asset management plans. The lowest tier consisted of buildings which were beyond hope. These went immediately into the disposal process. This new discipline of looking at buildings as financial assets, just as a private sector owner would, had a profound impact on the public building service organization and the behavior of our professional managers. Our people understood the new rules and an agency-wide consensus informed by a sense of urgency developed around what separated valuable assets from those uh, ready for disposal. Property disposals accelerated, and since then GSA has disposed of hundreds of its own buildings, representing millions of square feet and translating into hundreds of millions of dollars of savings to the taxpayer. Today, GSA has very few empty buildings in its inventory. 
the moral of this success story is that good disposal policy grows out of good, disciplined, life cycle asset management. Moreover, even without any statutory reform, the disposal mechanism which GSA administers for itself and across government can produce results once the bureaucracy understands the rules and is motivated to put individual functionally or physically obsolescent properties serving no programmatic purpose into the, the disposal process. The chief impediments to timely and aggressive disposal of surplus Federal properties are these. One, Federal executives have inadequate financial incentive to declare properties excess and turn them over to GSA for disposal. Agencies incur front-end costs which are often not reimbursed, and in the absence of special legislative authority, they do not get to retain the sales proceeds even if their property makes it to the open market and has any market value. Two, the disposal process itself is attenuated and Byzantine. Statute and regulation, including adherence to rigid environmental standards, community benefit criteria, and historic preservation considerations, all of which are desirable from a social perspective, obviously, virtually ensure that disposals become public benefit conveyances or negotiated sales with little or no economic benefit to the Federal Government as seller. Three, politics intrudes or, as they say in government, external shareholders, including members of Congress, special interests and advocacy groups, and State, county and local officials, have ample opportunity to intervene, slow down and redirect the process to achieve lots of results except returning money to the Federal Treasury. A BRAC-style approach to Federal property disposal, such as the Administration and Representative Denham have proposed, would have several distinct advantages over the present system. It would require by law that agencies produce real lists of excess properties. It would provide the framework for intragovernmental dispute resolution in administering the process, so often lacking now. It would insulate the process from extraneous and unproductive political interference, and it would be measurable, requiring a specific outcome within a finite time frame. These are all salutary results. I would add only a few cautionary notes. First, keep expectations real. With rare exceptions, most of the government's disposable property, as CBO has correctly reported, has limited market value. This is particularly true if the property must be offered to public entities at little or no cost. Second, ensure that agencies have enough upfront money to participate uh, and to discourage malicious compliance. This means not only providing funds to defray the costs of bringing properties to market, but the related and potentially much larger costs of replacing, through consolidation and co-location, Federal workplace places eliminated by disposal. Third, do not underestimate the challenges of, of applying a BRAC-like discipline, which was created to serve one agency, albeit a huge agency, with one mission to the entire government, across dozens of agencies with very diverse missions and constituencies. Fourth, remove the great, to the greatest extent supportable or feasible the many statutory and regulatory roadblocks to bringing properties to the market. If a private sector result is expected, constraints on the Federal Government that would not constrain a private seller need to be modified, replaced, or suspended, as proposed in Representative Chaffetz's bill. And finally, know that the implementation by law of a wholesale approach to the disposal of surplus Federal property will have, I believe, the undesirable practical effect of slowing down or even stopping other ongoing disposal activity under present law until it can take effect. So once implemented, it really needs to work. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide uh, testimony on this critical subject, so very timely, as we as a country struggle as never in modern times to reduce the cost of government. I am, of course, available to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Morbeck. At this time, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here and uh, allowing us to have some uh, input into this and some conversation back and forth on it. I just want to have uh, some conversation on it. An, an independent board set up to be able to take these issues on. My, my question is, is that needed, or what I am hearing from your conversation, do we really need to clean up the rules that GSA has to function under already? And anyone can start taking that on. But I am hearing some saying the whole process is very slow because of, I love the term, the Byzantine rules uh, that are in place to be able to deal with this. So are we creating some independent agency which will at some point have its own Byzantine rules at some point, or do we need to just clean up the GSA process to streamline this? Uh, speaking for myself, uh, I am skeptical, like apparently you are, about creating a new bureaucracy to do the work uh, that we have an existing of, of bureaucracy existing to do, bureaucracy right. that, that often fails and costs a lot of money. Uh, uh, BRAC works because it was one agency and had, had really one challenge, uh, and that 
it worked reasonably well. Uh, the BRAC process, by taking the, the workings of this outside of the framework of government, in a sense, uh, does, in fact, insulate it from many of the things that, that impede its efficient function. Politics. Politics, yeah. politics being the principal one. Right. But do you think that is the principal issue here, or the, is the politics of it, or is the principal issue here how slow and difficult and tenuous it is to go through all of the requirements that GSA is now having to labor, labor under? The latter. I do, I, I, that, that is what I am asking. An independent yes. board seems to be solving the wrong problem here. I think that uh, what, what is needed uh, is, is, as has been previously testified by uh, three of the four witnesses on this panel, uh, are incentives for Federal managers to declare property excess and to move it into the, swiftly into the disposal chute. Uh, I think the law needs to be either suspended or modified or streamlined to an extent that it, uh, that it uh, in a way that is not obviously irresponsible, right. uh, that, uh, that when it is deemed to be impeding the process. And finally, you really do need to insulate it from, uh, from uh, interference. Uh, I mean, right now it is a very open process, and it is not unlike procurement. Once the government decides to procure something and enters into a formal procurement process, it is insulated from politics, in my right. experience. Right. I understand. That, uh, several of you mentioned the incentive issue, and you can respond in your answer to the, my first question as well if you choose to. The incentive issue also brings up its own dynamic as well. Um, I am not interested in having agencies hold on to properties in case there is a lean year when at some point Congress cuts their budget and so they are banking properties over here saying if it ever gets lean, I have got my own stockpile of money basically in real property that I can sell and then have more money at that point, if you understand what I mean. So how do we deal with incentives without creating a property bank for different agencies to be able to have and sell it at their whim? Well, I think I would just like to step back to the, the first question. I think the disposal process as it is set up now, there are a lot of steps and it can take some time. But at GSA, we have figured out how to navigate that process. And many of the screenings we do simultaneously while we are doing other due diligence to prepare and a property. How long does that take? Not, not counting listing it, getting, getting it out. How long does that take to go through that process? Right now, it is comparable with private sector. And so it depends on the type of disposal. Um, and, and it can be, you know, when we get to the point of sale, as I mentioned in my, my opening statement, anywhere from 60 days all the way um, to you know, as much as six months. Um, but where we tend to hit the pause button is where we get a lot of those competing stakeholder interests and their discussions back and forth of, is it eligible for this uh, you know, public benefit or should it go for this use or that use? Uh, and so that is really what the Board was designed to try and help do, is insulate from that. Uh, on your second question in regards to the retention of proceeds, I, I think at this point the, the majority of the work we do at GSA happens to be for agencies that can retain proceeds. Uh, and, and as CBO pointed out, many agencies find it cheaper to hold on to a property in a given year um, and pay the minimal operating cost as opposed to prepping something for sale where there could be significant upfront investment. So something like the administration's proposal or some of the other bills that provide a way to cover some of those upfront costs and provide an incentive for agencies to where they can get some of the benefit back to recover those costs they may have to, to make in those properties to get them ready for sale is critical to, I think, getting many of these properties broken loose. I don't see it as a big land bank right now. I think there is really an economic disincentive to agencies okay. disposing of property. Okay. Thank you. So you are going to make a comment on that as well. Congressman Lanford, I would like to address your questions sure. as well. Yeah, I just have a few seconds left. So. Okay. Thank you. Well, so on the first point, um, I think the answer is not to create a new board or a new bureaucracy, but to streamline the current process. And on the comment that was just made, it is not because of competing stakeholders, certainly not because of Title V, which is our concern here, that the process is Byzantine or takes a long time. Title V adds a matter of mere months, and what it does is it ensures that public resources, Federal properties, are used for what is a public need and a growing public need and a national priority, which is addressing homelessness. That is not the cause of the delays. The 14,000 properties are, have, not, have already gone through Title V. Almost all of them have, and they are not holding up the process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I need to yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Lankford. The Chair now recognizes a colleague and friend from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. I thank the Chair, and I, I want him to know that my great-grandfather Kelly would be so proud to know there is a Kelly in the Chair. 
He might even be proud of his great grandson wearing that shirt. But that's, uh, at <laughs> any rate. Uh, uh, and, and I want to uh, thank the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for being so uh, gracious in letting me go. I, and welcome all of you. And, and I particularly want to thank uh, Ms. Boscarinas for being here, uh, because you are a great witness to the fact that there are considerations other than maximizing our profit when we talk about the disposal of excess property. Uh, in Northern Virginia, we have examples of incredible positive uh, results by careful disposal of a property, an excess property, namely the old Lorton Federal Prison site. Uh, and then we have examples where it didn't work out so well, the GSA site in Springfield, which is where the Mark Center should have been put, and unfortunately it wasn't, and we are now going to face you know, catastrophic results in terms of transportation on the I-95 corridor uh, here in the National Capital Region. And uh, if you look at Lorton, uh, one of the things that created unbelievable economic energy at an arts foundation in the retrofit of the prison workhouse, a new world-class golf course, uh, lots of new open space and playing fields and new trails, uh, the preservation of almost 2,000 acres, nonetheless, it generated in the immediate vicinity enormous economic activity, new town centers, new residents, new commercial centers. It is now the fastest growing part of my community. Ten years ago, it was, the, it was losing population and it was lagging behind any other part of, the, uh, of Fairfax County in terms of economic activity. The, but what gave us that energy? It was the fact, the willingness of the Federal Government to sell that property to the local government at below market rate. It generated jobs and economic activity and had incredible positive externalities. But had we stuck to a rigid standard that, sorry, that property has to be disposed of at market rates, it absolutely would have had to have been developed uh, in ways that were not consistent with community goals and, frankly, would have done economic harm. And so my question to you all is, uh, and I notice the Quigley bill sort of has a provision, and, and I think this is a conservative principle, Mr. Chairman, not just uh, a Democratic or, or Republican principle. Let's take into account the realities on the ground and the needs and wishes of the local governments, uh, because they know their communities best. Because we can be a force for good in the disposal of excess property, and we can also, frankly, unwittingly, be a, a, a factor of, of not so good. So I, I just open that up to the panel and would welcome your, your reactions to that proposition. Sure, Congressman. We, we certainly appreciate the local community interest, and my experience has shown that successful property disposition requires a ton of outreach and partnership with the local uh, community entities. And I think any of these proposals, you would still have to have that for successful property disposition. I, I think even in instances where a property, you know, could go to a homeless use or you might not see the proceeds from the sales, there are tremendous benefits uh, to the government in terms of reduced operating cost and maintenance for many of these facilities where there is no longer a need, um, and, and from the consolidation and, and different uses uh, of those properties. So, for instance, the government has thousands of properties uh, across the country uh, where they have got locations for field offices in, in every community. There are different ways of doing business now, and a lot of the work can be done online and through different mechanisms. So looking at does it make sense to still have all of those properties across the country, or is there a way to consolidate that or do it differently that could free up many properties for disposal? And even if they did go for a homeless use or another public benefit conveyance, there would still be significant cost savings for the Federal Government and the taxpayer. Yes, thank you for that comment, Congressman. I think you are absolutely right. It is not just about maximizing uh, proceeds. It is also about um, a longer-term approach and how the properties can be used for the greater public good and, and also to generate savings, because in the case of Title V, service providers who, who take the properties, who get the properties, take on the operations and maintenance costs, which are now or otherwise being borne by the Federal Government. So that is a cost saving. And they are also providing an important public um, good. And in nor Northern Virginia, for example, there is also the Carpenter sh Shelter, which is providing services and a place to stay for working homeless men and women. That is 
incredibly important, helping people become productive members of society again. I thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time is up, but while you were out of the room, I was just pointing out that your predecessor and my predecessor, Mr. Davis, and this committee have a great success story in working with uh, GSA in the disposal of the Lorton property. And although we didn't maximize proceeds in the actual transfer to the local government, the economic activity it generated more than made up for that. It's, it's one of the great success stories of how to do it carefully, I think, uh, as we proceed on this whole subject tonight. I thank well, the and I thank the gentleman. Would the gentleman yield? Of course, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons early on in the, the hearing that I said to our three earlier witnesses how much I appreciated what was in their bills, but questioned some of the things that were not in their bills. And, and clearly their desire for speed, because speed ultimately means we save money sooner, has to be offset with the consideration of the best good, uh, not just the highest dollar. So that is part of where this committee is going to make sure we blend some of their suggestions with some ideas like yours. I thank the Chairman, and I couldn't agree with him more, and I look forward to working with him on this. Thank session. you. With that, we go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Well, thank you. Um, I am going to go across the board with this, but I am going to kind of make a real brief statement. Um, Arizona, as you know, is, is heavily laden with Federal inventory of not only lands, but also buildings, okay? not only from a private sector, but from a Native American sector, okay? through the BIA. Um, I see a working relationship, not just in, in capitalization of, of, of selling to the private industry, but also to local communities. I want to bring up that you know, we have been underfunded with our secure programs, our PILT programs that have been diminishing because of our restrictions on our national lands, uh, multi-use aspects. So I see this in a different perspective and actually have engaged in, in uh, local communities, both county governments and city governments, to inventory Federal buildings in which to take in lieu of. Um, and I think this works extremely well, particularly in a State like Arizona. Um, that the proceeds from um, our natural resources and from our Federal and State lands go to our schools and go to some of our health care issues. It is very similar to like Wyoming and Alaska. Um, tell me how you would streamline, particularly an inventory of first, a first right of refusal to communities of interest like cities and towns and, and counties. How would you streamline and what would you streamline in a situation um, so that we could have that um, aspect um, or, or further this process down? I'm not just interested in homeless people because, you know, I'm from Flagstaff, um, very large amounts of Federal ground, very limited amounts of private ground. Uh, we need to have the working families being able to afford, the teachers. We need to have people being able to afford to stay and live there. Maybe it's a stepping stone to see generational kids that want to stay in, in towns to be able to move into a segment that is maybe a lower rent districts, um, Habitat for Humanity, whatever it may be that is conditional with the local and state uh, entities. Tell me how you would proceed and what do you see the roadblocks are and how can we get that first? First from the private sector with, with uh, not private sector, but with cities, counties, and second from the BIA, which is even more important to me. I think it is even more streamlined and can be very much more quickly for the BIA because of the self-determination rules that it accept. We will start with you, Mr. Moravec, down to the uh, Thank you. I would say, first, uh, I, like uh, some of the other members are, I am skeptical of huge financial benefits coming out, of this, uh, coming out of this process. I mean, the real advantage to the Federal Government is savings in terms of expenditures for maintenance. Uh, but as a practical matter, there are things need to be done to reform the process, and that is what I think your question is, is focusing on. I think I was very pleased to hear uh, Ms. Foscarinas uh, mention when talking about Title V uh, that there needs to be, that, that one step might be to immediately exclude properties that were clearly not suitable for housing, uh, housing the homeless. I mean, that would be a great step in the right direction, rather than putting it through a, an intra-governmental, uh, intra-agency process involving HUD and GSA and other shareholders. If, if there could be a way of focusing quickly and achieving consensus very quickly on whether a property was suitable for homeless and then removing it from the process if it wasn't would be a very big step in the right direction. I think another way uh, would be to limit the time that external or, or local sh uh, shareholders have to, to make their views known, to sort of cut off the debate when it wasn't leading to a, a fru fruitful or productive outcome. Uh, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Foley testified, that really is where the delay is. These, the properties sort of get into this limbo land where there is no way of dis resolving the, the uh, disputes or the competing interests of groups for 
uh, for claiming a, a property that has been declared surplus. Could, could you see a hierarchical aspect of first right of refusal, particularly when you look in lieu of taxes, particularly what we have seen from secured schools and PILTs, um, that the counties and, and cities have an advantage or a state has an advantage over? Or, I, I think it would be very difficult to establish a template or a, a, an inflexible hierarchy. of. That is essentially what we have now. I think uh, each individual asset is different and deserves to be treated as an individual problem, and the solutions can be very different uh, asset by asset. So I would be, I would be hesitant to, to establish a right of first refusal protocol just that would then again be tried to apply, uh, would be applied in a wholesale way. Um, I know running out we time, do so. suggest streamlining the process so that um, properties that are clearly not suitable are excluded. For example, national security properties, contaminated properties, properties inside secure facilities, military properties, or inside military facilities. We also suggest publishing the list of properties online as opposed to in the Federal Register and um, publicizing them through a listserv and a database electronically. We are also suggesting requiring the Federal agencies to provide greater outreach and support um, to applicants. Right now, um, this is a very cumbersome and difficult process, and the applicants are typically unsophisticated shelter or um, other service providers. Greater support would allow these providers to more quickly complete the process and would streamline it. Don't you um, think? Don't you think? And in, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, the gentleman could have 30 additional seconds. Okay. Um, don't you think that that a, a wonderful point to to revolutionize this? It would be the Native Americans because of the unique treaty obligations that we share with them, and the BIA constraints on that. To see, to me, it seems like it's a perfect fit to demonstrate um, ownership to the tribe in in the Self Determination Act. It actually is the first step of maybe revolutionizing how we look at these inventories, because you need to deal strictly with the tribe first mm -hmm. and then the individual entities. Mm -hmm. And I disagree that the homeless is the number one aspect, because I think you also have to have the empowerment of economies with the tribes that, that associate both. And then I also think that you look at the veterans aspects of empowerment as well. So those are my two cents worth, and I'd like to get, you know, I've run out of time, but love to have your additional comments for the record. Well, we'll oh, yeah. okay. May I briefly? Uh, you, you may have the time you need to I may respond. Have He's Mr. Done. Chairman. He's done. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. I like that. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I, Congressman, I'm not familiar, unfortunately, with the specific um, co constraints on tribes or requirements, but I do know that tribes certainly suffer from homelessness and poverty, and that is a very, very critical issue. Veterans as well, many homeless people are veterans, and so it's very important that we address that issue. I think the larger point is um, to allow these properties to be used for any kind of permanent um, housing, not just right now it is limited to home, homeless shelters or services for homeless people um, or permanent supportive housing, but we are advocating for an expansion to permanent housing per se so that um, a broader swath of needs can be met. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mr. Lebeter. We are now going to the uh, former chairman of the full committee, Mr. Towns. I would be delighted to yield him a Mr. Chairman, I will yield in 30 seconds. It is all yours. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I was just going to yield my time to Mr. Goser, so we will wait. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I reclaim my time. We, you understand, we have a lot of formality in our informality sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And way too much comedy, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, you know, I Happy to see you, um, uh, Ms. Fosserinas. Um, you know, I knew Stu McKinney. He was a very good friend of mine. And of course, I remember the work in those days. Um, and of course, let me begin by, we established that tens of thousands of properties are languishing in the Federal inventory without being sold. And some agencies have blamed Title V, uh, the process for slowing down their ability to dispose of property. Uh, for example, in 2008, the Department of Veterans Affairs reported that GAO 
that the requirements for the McKinney Act can add as much as two years uh, to the disposal process. Uh, Ms. Fasarinas, uh, recognizing that you are one of the primary uh, architects of the McKinney Act, I want to address a few questions to you. Uh, does the screening process for Title V require that agencies screen Federal property for use by nonprofits serving the homeless even when the property is entirely unsuitable for the purpose? Um, Congressman Towns, it does not. But unfortunately, the, um, the way that the language does not, but the way the, the program has been interpreted, the screening process is, in our view, overly broad, so that properties come into the process that clearly are not suitable. And that is one of our recommendations. We think it could be streamlined, but I don't think that that is the main problem or that Title V is the cause of the delays or the reason why all those properties are now languishing. In fact, the majority are almost all of those 14,000 properties that are now languishing that have been referred to by a number of witnesses, they have already been through the Title V process. Title V is not the problem. So what is the problem? Um, well, I am not an expert on the entire Federal property disposition process, but I am um, familiar with Title V, and I know that Title V is not holding up the process. The process happens after Title V, and, the pro and that is a process that, um, that has that, that I, that's a question that needs to be addressed to the other pieces, the other um, the agencies that, that deal with that process. It, well, most people here today um, uh, seem to agree that current property disposal process is not working. Uh, what would you suggest we change to improve the disposal process and to make it work more efficiently? What are well, your ideas? Well, Congressman, I think as far as Title V is concerned, much can be done to speed up and streamline the process so that properties that are potentially suitable to help homeless people are quickly identified so that the agencies support applicants in the process, which, as I mentioned, the, the applicants are often very unsophisticated, under-resourced nonprofit organizations additional support from the Federal agencies to help them complete the process um, would be would help streamline streamline that process. I think as well that um, making available resources from the Federal government, for example, we have proposed five percent of sales from all Federal property dispositions could be used to support the homeless service providers in um, applying for and operating their programs on the property, that would help expedite it. Right. Mr. Foley, let me ask you the same question. Sure. I, I think, as I testified, the three main areas that we need to do to improve the Federal um, disposition process for real property uh, are, one, we need to provide an incentive for agencies to dispose of unneeded and underutilized property. Two, we have to have a way to help fund some of the upfront costs that are required, whether it is through consolidation or cleanup of property or just basic work to get it ready for sale. And then three, we have to figure out how to deal with the competing stakeholder interests that can delay the process down the line. Um, so again, it can be after screening and, and as you get down into figuring out what is going to happen to the property next. Um, and so that is really, I think, the three areas where we can make a big difference and improve the process. Well, you know, um, I think that um, the three bills that have been put forward, forward you know, really, really could help in a, in a lot of ways. But still, I, I see some problems, you know, as we uh, move forward, even with the uh, three bills that we talked about earlier uh, to today. So, Mr. Chairman, I think we still have a lot of work to be done. But I think that that is a framework that we can start from and that uh, we can do a lot better than what we are doing. So thank you. I yield back. And I thank you and, and very much agree we can. Mr. Labrador. Mr. Chairman, I, I yield my time to Mr. Gosar. I am shocked. <laughs> the gentleman is recognized. I don't object to that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, first, BIA, they do have standing in the current Federal disposal process, uh, and I believe it happens at the, the Federal screening. So Department of Interior would express an interest on behalf of, of um, the, the tribe. Uh, so they do have an opportunity before it even gets to the point of the public benefits and those. Okay. Right. 
to, do, to actually challenge that ruling. It is almost an absolute ruling, and that can't work. Okay. So there is something wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. So keep going. Sure. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the, the items that my colleagues here on the panel uh, mentioned are critical. I, I think determining up front which properties really are suitable for which entity so you don't have a, a rigid process that requires screening of, of properties we all agree may not be suitable. Um, and we do have some flexibility with many of the screening processes. Um, so for instance, if it is not near an airport, we wouldn't do an airport screening. Uh, so figuring out how we determine which properties are most suitable. Putting more strict time limits on, I, I think the actual limits for the, the um, screening process for homeless is, is only about 60 days and 30 days for many of the others. So it is not really the process itself. As you mentioned, it is when there is a, a dispute or a discrepancy and, and then trying to sort through uh, and figure those pieces out. I think, thirdly, um, as Ms. Foscarinas mentioned, clearly anything we can do to improve uh, transparency and community outreach uh, and, and outreach to our partners. Uh, is critical so that they understand which properties are available, they understand what the uses are, uh, and we have a better under understanding up front which screenings and, and which uses would be most appropriate for that type of property. Mrs. Yes, Gill. I, mean, I, I don't know much about the BIA's um, role in this process, but it's, it sounds to me that we are talking um, bureaucratic issues that could potentially be solved through changing the existing process and that you wouldn't necessarily need a new um, civilian board or something to, to address and resolve some of those issues. But as Mr. Foley pointed out, a lot of the problems um, end up coming in terms of local stakeholder um, um, interests that sometimes conflict with what other people want to do with the land. And that can often slow things down and even prevent property from getting um, exchanged or given to people. So, though, and and well, don't you? I, I mean, I, I to me, I mean, I, I'm a business guy, and and you know, I'm also from the the nonprofit uh, found uh, arena as well. So there's there, there's there's some risks that you take, and when you start looking at this in competing ventures, you know, um, particularly when we're putting the handicap about the homeless, I've got a big heart. Don't get me wrong, but you got to make this into a play that actually. Um, is competitive. And that is, is that if we are going to make sure that everything is, is, if I sell my house, okay, I have to look at the, and somebody wants to buy it. We go through negotiation. Okay, Dr. Gosart, we don't like this about the house. We want you to give this in, in compensation for upgrades, da, 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 da. We ought to be doing that at the Federal level, not adjudicating this thing we are going to have to handicap it and put more additional money here. We want to allow the competing factors to bring assets to the table. We can't hold everybody's hand. We are in a financial crisis here. And we have to empower people to, to fix things, to be at the bargaining table, to put risk in the game, which brings me to my next point. It seems to me like we have a contractual hierarchy already, okay? Because we have established, particularly in the Western States, because you know, like in my state of Arizona, we have 60 percent, 72 percent in my district that is federally owned for multiple use. So it seems to me that the hierarchical aspect there is first for disposal is to education, communities or state land, counties, cities, and smaller entities. And that is how it has to go. That seems to me that we ought to be dialoguing first at the state level and state by state to include them into that risk pool, because we have had contractual obligations. And I'm not a lawyer, but I do understand something about contracts. Is they they are not subservient usually to other whims. They are contractually the hierarchical aspect. So I would hope that you would look at, and I may further some other questions to you. Look at in that vein is how do we structure this maybe to expedite a contractual obligation not only to our states but to our counties and cities in the expedition of, of these properties. So thank you. I ran out of time. I thank you. I recognize myself now for a round of questioning. Uh, pardon me? I haven't asked. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The um, Congressional Budget Office and the White House have, a, uh, have very different estimates of the potential revenue that could be generated through the President's uh, proposed Civilian Property uh, Realignment Act. The White House estimates the proposal would generate more than $15 billion in additional gross receipts over a five-year period. 
Over that same five-year period, CBO estimates that implementing the President's proposal would cost $420 million uh, in additional. Um, this is quite a large discrepancy. Mr. Foley, would you explain how you arrived at the $15 billion estimate? Certainly. The administration's proposal, we looked at, at as broad a range of savings as we could possibly get. So everything from proceeds when we sell a property to eliminating operating costs uh, when you no longer have a, a property in, in Federal use uh, to cost avoidance for future renovations that we would have to do. Uh, and then another component that I think is critical to that is uh, consolidations as well. I mentioned uh, previously where there are opportunities to, you know, downsize and get rid of three locations and move to one, or six locations and, and move to one potentially. Um, and, and so, when you look at all of those factors, uh, there are, I think, the potential for cost savings are enormous. So, so you've got, so you don't, you go beyond just what it would be sold for. You go into all those other things. Correct. When we are talking about the $15 billion number, it is not just direct sales proceeds of dollars that would be received back from property that, that would be sold. Well, why is the CBO's uh, estimate so much different? We certainly respect CBO's opinion, and, and I think that you know, the way they looked at, at the legislation, they even recognized that there would be cost savings to those. I think it gets down into the interpretation of what happens uh, as a result of those cost savings. So uh, are the funds actually still given to agencies, or is there a change in the appropriations? And I, I don't want to speak for CBO. No, she can, she can, it, it can speak for herself, but I'm just but, curious. What's the difference? Do you know? Well, I think that, um, that Mr. Foley is correct that, that our job is to look at the net effects on the Federal budget over a certain time period. And we do think that a proposal such as the President's proposal for the Civilian Board would increase receipts by a, a modest amount. The problem is that by allowing some agencies that currently are not allowed to keep their proceeds from sales, um, and that money goes 100 percent to the Treasury under current law, this proposal would allow those agencies to keep 40 percent of the proceeds. So right there you have got a net cost to the Treasury. Again, we think that is fairly small um, because the bottom line is we don't see over the next five years that there is a stock of properties that are, going to, that are valuable enough to produce a large enough um, receipt to the Treasury that is really going to net out against those types of costs. We do agree that there could be savings in um, operation and maintenance costs over time. Those costs are only going to get realized to the Treasury, to the government, however, if future appropriations are reduced. So again, from CBO's point of view, you have got the difference between direct spending and discretionary savings, um, which, um, so it is just a matter of those different pots of money. It is very hard to see and calculate those types of O&M savings. We are not saying they wouldn't accrue to the Treasury, but unless you can see in the future that a total appropriations will be reduced by that amount of money, then the government hasn't really reduced the deficit at all. So, and we have seen that with the BRAC process. BRAC has surely resulted through consolidations in lower O&M costs, but you certainly can't see that by looking at O&M spending by the Defense Department. It has continued to go up. So you, in order to, to calculate those savings, you'd have to know what the costs for O&M would have been without BRAC. And that is a sort of counterfactual that is pretty hard to calculate. So we think that there are savings. I actually think that over the next 10 years, the idea that we would save $15 billion, even in reduced O&M costs, if what we are talking about is, is, um, is getting rid of excess properties, is unlikely, because the average maintenance costs of those excess properties is actually fairly low. The high costs come in those underutilized properties, and the underutilized properties are going to be harder to get ready for sale and dispose of. And that is where you could start seeing some significant O&M savings from consolidating and then getting rid of some of those underutilized properties. But that is going to be a harder thing to do. Well, I am sure the economy is going to get better, but you know, in, in Baltimore we have a, a dis dispute going on right now, right now 
with regard to building some, a new state center with all the state offices because there is so much vacant property downtown. So the, the, the vacant property owners downtown are saying, wait a minute, why are you building new buildings? Well, we've got all this vacant property. I guess my the problem. I mean, the, the, I mean, your estimates. Do you take into consideration the fact that there's already a lot of private problems right now, particularly with commercial properties and things of that nature? Well, I certainly think those issues go to um, estimates of what the value of a, pr a right. particular property is. Absolutely, um, and that will could sometimes depress the average values of. Um, properties, Federal properties that might be available in that area. Okay. Can I just add one more thing? I, I think that you know another area of savings is in, in the leased inventory. So an example of GSA is our headquarters building that we are renovating, and, and we intend to improve the utilization. Uh, prior to the renovation, we had about 2,500 people assigned to the building. After the renovation, we are going to have 6,000 people assigned to the building. And, and so that is going to eliminate O&M costs in a few Federal facilities. It is going to eliminate um, lease costs that we are currently paying the private sector for space that we are occupying. And I think there are a lot of opportunities out there like that that are contemplated under the administration's bill that are hard to score what the, the direct benefits are, but there are potential tremendous millions and millions and billions of dollars worth of savings that are out there, because that is one small example right here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am going to continue with the ranking member's line in a number of ways. but. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Foscarinas, mm -hmm. I am going to ask you, in your, one of your proposals, uh, which would be to develop, for HUD to be required to develop a grant program for construction and rehabilitation of Title V properties funded at 5 percent, let me ask you the crux of sort of the program as it has been versus the program as it could be. If you received a percentage greater than your current percentage you are actually historically received, a, a percentage either in cash or uh, obviously you could use that cash or that, those, those chits to bid on properties, but you were simply a bidder, would that streamline your system? So you wouldn't look at a building unless you wanted a building. You wouldn't care if a tribe was picking up a piece of land, a city was picking up a piece of land, you would essentially get a commission out of the decommissioning process that would build up a fund, probably administered by HUD, that would result in grants where you could go, or at least the homeless in general could apply for grants that would allow them to pick the location and the least cost and most efficient uh, place to take care of homeless needs. Is that the system that if, if this was a perfect world, we would use this funding mechanism to provide you with uh, options? Um, Chairman Issa, I appreciate the question. Our recommendation is for a fund in addition to I the know it is, uh, and I am not going there. Okay. Uh, and I am not going there for a reason. That is subject to an appropriation that is easy to talk about and unlikely to be easy to achieve. And it is one of the reasons that as we are looking at property disposal, we are looking at you historically getting about 2 percent of property. And as you say, rightfully, you get the property, you get it late, you get it in sometimes not so great condition, certainly not in as good a condition as you looked at it at the mm -hmm. beginning of the process, uh, and then you take over maintenance and utilities and so on. I am looking and saying if we in this process have an opportunity to streamline the system and to help the homeless be better off than they are from a dedicated pool of money, mm -hmm. then we on this committee have the ability to do what we cannot do if we are subject to appropriation. Mm -hmm. We can have all the discussion we want, but if I author a bill, ranking member authors a bill, it is going to be subject to appropriation and it is going to be subject to other committees' jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the reasons I ask you a more focused question is I mm am -hmm. looking and saying, what is it we can do for you? Uh -huh. Well. Um, we have focused on the property itself because we feel that in many communities access to a piece of property is really key. And it's, um, we have not been open um, to this point to the idea of instead of the property substituting money, because we feel that the property is important and it gives 
an important um, resource to, um, to groups who otherwise but, might not have access to and, it. And we are we're assuming that in many cases you would use this fund at HUD and the grants provided from that fund to bid on those properties, but you would be bidding with sort of this earmarked money. This, if today you are getting right. 2 percent and the fund is 4 percent, now you have a grant process administered where they are looking at the needs of various communities. Mm -hmm. They are prioritizing the community, cer certainly that needs homeless shelters. Perhaps they are looking disproportionately at where there also are home opportun or opportunities because of land or buildings, mm -hmm. but it is administered by the agency that we expect to look at the homeless problem to where, quite frankly, in Mr. Gosar's district, the disposal of land with some buildings that may or may not, they may be way out there, they may be of no value, but they are part of the pool. On the other hand, in, in Mr. Cummings' district, it may be or may not be that the building being uh, uh, delivered is of any value to you, but it is in the right area. Mm -hmm. So you have both the option of bidding on the building and the option of uh, to the grant limit, uh, whatever you know, HUD would, is going to make available. But basically, HUD would be your partner sitting there saying, we are going to pay what we need to pay to get this building. And I am not prejudging whether that would be a true auction or a appraised value or some other system. What I am viewing is it would be quick because you would have your partner and you would have this pool of money. Mr. Cummings and I would say, you know, the politics are out of it. We are not trying to uh, force a decision in our community. We are looking and saying we have an agency, they have an allocation of money from all dispositions that gives uh, a predictability greater than it is today. And quite frankly, that money would allow you to have what you are asking for here, which is this 5 percent net proceeds. It, we could talk about 5 percent, 2 percent. It is not important for the percentage. But the idea is it would be built in a single fund where you would be, in fact, generating both the purchase acquisition, if you will, and the renovation. Mm -hmm. I am not sure we can get to 5 plus 2, which is what your arithmetic adds up to, or 7 percent, uh, you know, or 2 percent of the material of the disposition and then 5 percent of the proceeds. Right. Well, that is assuming, of course, that 2 percent is the right number. Uh I guess it's just a historic number, and that's right. that's that's what I want to improve from. Right, I understand. Um, we need to look at that as a, uh, as a in detail as a specific proposal. Our concern about substituting money for buildings is that there are already appropriations through HUD and through other federal agencies to assist homeless persons. Um, they are not sufficient by far. I mean, the funding now is vastly oversubscribed. We our concern is we don't want this resource, which is a different type of resource, to become part of that mix of appropriations where, you know, we can cut or not significantly increase other HUD funding because, well, we have this other pool of money and that goes into the overall mix. That is our concern. And there is also a separate concern about the property itself. In many communities, having a building makes a big difference because community groups face issues like nimbyism. They face opposition. These buildings are typically, um, because they are Federal property, they can um, more easily, and they are being used for a Federal um, purpose, they can bypass some of that community opposition and allow, give greater strength to the group trying to use them. So there are reasons why the property matters. However, you know, we are open to discussing um, any proposal. We need to take a look at the specifics sure. of Well, and I would like your thoughts as, as we go through this process. Uh, like I say, I, I, I jumped on to the 5 percent, mm -hmm. but I knew that, in fact, there is a certain point at which the appropriators start saying, uh, we are not going to let that happen. So we want to make sure we steer clear of it. Ms. Gullo, uh, there is a number of things that I am interested in. In your, in your report, which is already in the record, oops, you, uh, you come up with some interesting figures as to Mr. Foley's organization's scoring. Forty-five percent of the buildings listed and structures were already on the list. So half of his $15 billion, if we assume all things being equal, or double counting potentially, or counting what has been previously counted. Twenty-eight percent of the buildings in your study will, are probably going to be demolished, which I, I hope they didn't score them before demolishment. Uh, Twenty percent have already been disposed of and are no longer uh, considered excess. 
that part certainly is going to affect the $15 billion. Uh, Six percent have already been slated for conveyance at little or no cost to other public entities, and less than 1 percent of the properties, a total of 30, are expected to be available for sale, and there are only, you know, the, what, 30 sales, and of them, the highest was $2.5 million. Is that also part of your belief that there isn't that much there there? Um, yes, sir. I mean, basically, I think what that, um, what that database shows is existing stock of excess properties. And I think many of those, as we pointed out, are already in the process of being disposed of. And I think the point we were making there are two. Um, first of all, most excess properties end up getting demolished, and a fairly small percentage um, are actually sold. And the, that property doesn't have a lot of value. So the point we were trying to make there is that in order to, to see receipts anywhere close to um, in the billions of dollars, you would have to identify significantly more valuable property um, and dispose of that through sales in order to, to get receipts of $15 billion. If what you are talking about are um, avoided O&M costs, then you could achieve avoided O&M costs with properties that aren't as valuable. Um, again, but aren't a lot of these properties? But, but they're most, basically being shuttered, and, and in many cases, the maintenance is not sufficient to maintain them at a usable level. Right. So the truth is, they're depreciating very, very quickly. These are buildings with leaky roofs, broken windows. They just try to stop the vandalism, pretty much. That's that's and Mr. Quigley mentioned. But that's that's what you see a lot, isn't right. it? Yeah. I mean, that that is our impression. I mean, Mr. Foley could probably speak. And Mr. Foley, I misstated. I, I the. I realize OMB's numbers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, let me just share with you something, and, and I know I'm going on, but since I'm kind of the last, I might get away with it. Uh, you know, I, I took a team down to Puerto Rico to look at Roosevelt Roads. Now, that was worth, and this is BRAC, but it was worth about $2 billion estimated at the time of closing. Today, it's worth about $0.02. Cents. Uh, all of the electrics have been damaged or destroyed. They estimate $110 million just in copper having been looted. Uh, and this is, by the way, while there are guards on the place, military operations still going on in small pockets of a large base. The giant iguana have destroyed the road uh, structure considerably, and they just try to keep patching them so their trucks can, or their cars can go over them just to inspect things. Uh, people implanted in the middle of the base little pockets of new military, thus making it impossible to sell the land in a way in which a developer would want to be there. To be quite frank, you don't necessarily want the National Guard armory right on the beach, but that is where they put the, the Army National Guard was right on the beach. So uh, needless to say, for the, uh, the casino or the resort or anybody else, it is uh, no longer very good. And on top of that, we spent as much as $110 million a year to maintain it with these guards and so on. Well, $60 million worth of uh, a, a power plant that had contamination has never been cleaned up. So the governor is looking forward to having it transferred to him at no cost, not much value, and we still have to do the $60 million on the power plant. That is my basis for concern. In addition to uh, Ms. Gullo, I am not so sure that you actually very quickly get that savings. I was at Fort Ord as a young Army officer, obviously a long time ago, but I watched it get closed. On the day it closed, I watched the carpenters continue to put new roofs on brand new buildings still under construction. We find a way to spend money even after we close things. Uh, I have one, one or two more quick questions. Uh, the, the American people see that we have this excess property. Currently, the inventory, and Mr. Foley more currently, and uh, Mr. Uh, Moravec uh, historically, isn't our biggest problem that we abandon property or choose not to go to it while we lease property down the street? I can show the FBI chooses to be in a nice tower building in a city where we have got excess military installation, because there is no structure to say, from a command and control standpoint, no, you will go to what we own if it is good enough. No, you may not rent what you want if we can, in fact, provide it cheaper. And, Mr. Foley, 
isn't that really part of the authority the GSA would need to start really reining in the selective, I've got my budget, I'm going where I want to go type mentality in the bureaucracy? I think our process right now um, does look at, do we have existing Federal properties first? But the biggest challenge often with those facilities is there is a cost to convert them. So you mentioned FBI, if you have to put in SCIF space or do something to improve the security around it, there is a cost to that. And finding the resources up front to be able to do that is often the biggest challenge versus going out and leasing where it, you know, it's just an annual rental payment. So you're looking at, in some cases, hundreds of billions of dollars to renovate an existing Federal facility or convert it for use versus an annual rental payment of you know, $3 or $4 million. Right. But, for example, if we took the GSA and we made you a leasing agent mm -hmm. and we took you off budget for a moment, in the perfect world we take you off budget, we make you a landlord. We will take it. <laughs> It ain't going to you personally. <laughs> and instead of looking at the capital cost of buying or the capital cost of renovating, we look at the competitive rent versus rent avoidance. So now we are actually scoring against your competitor, the private sector competitor. And I am as private sector as anybody that will ever sit on this dais. But I will give you an example, Moffett Field. We have donated huge amounts of tracks to schools and everybody we can think of. Well, in fact, major Federal agencies are sitting in very expensive space in San Jose, Santa Clara, in the area. Why? Well, I can't quite figure it out. It is not that I don't want to do good, but those agencies could have been told the GSA has land behind a secure gate. We already have NASA and highly classified programs there. We can put you behind that gate. We will put you behind that gate, and we will meet your requirements, as we see, for renovation. Maybe CapEx was part of it, but quite frankly, our per-year cost, we have tenants that pay almost nothing for land that and facilities they normally wouldn't have taken, except it was almost free, and we are not talking homeless in this case. Uh, you can't afford to be homeless in San Jose, as it turns out. Uh, don't we need to change that system so that we don't score, and this is really a CBO thing, can't we get to where we score it in a 10-year uh, window or a 20-year window so that we are not constantly trying to look at these CapExes? My bases have, including Camp Pendleton, have PPV. PPV is a good program because of a bad accounting system that we live under. The idea that we pay somebody 50 years worth of a guaranteed lease so that they will make the CapEx so we don't have to, and it scores cheaper for us, is a disingenuous way of doing it. But the fact is the appropriators won't guarantee they will do the MilCon every year, and there is no agency that has the ability to say, look, we can compete and really meet this cost at the same or less, but we are not able to compete. Ms. Gallo. Congressman, we agree with you on the issue of capital leases. Um, and if, when we see legislation that would um, authorize and allow for that kind of a long-term lease, um, CBO scoring will score that up the full costs of those up front. I mean, so we, we agree with you. You are stuck that. with the, the existing way of scoring right. because we have given it to you. Right. But, um, but I think, and that is not always the way, I mean, if it is if, um, if um, an ongoing um, lease that is just for, you know, annual leases, then those are scored just on a cash basis each year. But we do tend to, to take that view that if, if we are entering into a long-term capital-type lease, we would score that up front, the full costs of that, so that it is a little bit more comparable to what we would have to pay or appropriate to build a building. You try to normalize it as best right. you can. But we PPV exists right. because of government's failures, not because it was inherently cheaper for the private sector to build barracks on my basis. Mr. I think that is right. I, I, would, I would add, I mean, the reason that the government leases space as opposed to constructs it or uh, finds a way of putting people in own space is several. It begins with the fact that uh, it is much easier to get the money from Congress for a lease than it, because of budget scorekeeping rules and because of the availability of funds than it is to federally construct or acquire space. Uh, secondly, it is much faster. The private sector actually is much faster at producing a, a finished facility that, is, that supports the mission of the, of the tenancy, uh, tenant agency than the, pri than the public sector. It just is. And the final thing is that the agencies actually prefer to be in private, modern, efficiently uh, run 
space as opposed to having to force themselves to accommodate their mission to an existing uh, federally owned installation. In your Moffitt Field example, that would be that's a great example, except that the, the, quite, it, of course, begs the question, where does the money come from to build the facility behind the fence? Okay, the land is free, but where does the money come from to build, a, a, in some, many cases, a special purpose building? That is one other thing I want to mention. A lot of these Federal buildings are not just plain vanilla office space. You mentioned the FBI. An FBI building is a very special purpose building. It has uh, uh, anti-progressive collapse technology in the way it is developed. It is typically on a very large site, for, so that it gives standoff distances to the surrounding areas. It has hardened curtain walls, blast-resistant glass, a lot of special, a special functionality. And it is just, you can't just move into, an, into a regular office building and turn it into that kind of facility especially given the Federal Government's uh, requirements with regard to security in the post-9-11 era and with regard to environmental sustainability, which are both highly laudable social objectives. When you add those factors in, uh, it really adds to the cost of, uh, of, of building a Federal building. Did I mention that the FBI took one of the shacks, I'm sorry, one of the old buildings at Roosevelt Roads? Uh, because they could, and, and, and we don't know what they are doing there, and we can't find <laughs> out. I want to thank the ranking member. This was an unusually long uh, set, and he was patient to, to hear me out. We will thank you for both your comments on some other areas and on this. The committee is committed to help in both parts, the property disposal, and trying to create a situation in which new acquisitions, whether leased or purchased, can be better thought out to save the American taxpayers money. And with that, we stand adjourned.